Yes, I think we should get started. Um, welcome everyone to the Taste Talks Wine Wednesday. And this is actually our first of some holiday themed Taste Talks that we will be doing. I definitely have some exciting things um, I'm working on coming up between now and New Year's because there are so many different reasons to celebrate. And of course, wine is one of the great reasons to celebrate, but we will have cocktails. We'll be talking about specialty foods. We'll definitely be touching on some different dishes and stuff over the next two months. So we, even though classes will be ending for our college students, education will be continuing here on the Taste Talks during this time. So I am very excited for Mary to give us some recommendations on wine and food pairings for the holidays. So we can actually start preparing now, start some of that shopping and make sure that we can have a really fantastic and fabulous Thanksgiving meal. Since some of our Thanksgivings might be a little smaller than we tend to have, maybe we wanna purge a little bit more on some of these wines and such as well. So. Mary, I am very excited to hear all of your recommendations for the holidays. Christine, as always, thank you. And what a joy to see all of you today. Uh, I, I really appreciate you taking your time out of your day. It's, uh, it's very gratifying to me. So here we go. And oh, I should mention that my article uh, last week, I did send that I talked about that fancy article on Tiroir. Well, lo and behold, it has published. Uh, you can go to the Daily Herald and search Mary Ross. Good wine is the name of the column. I just dropped it in the chat for everyone as well, too. Thank you, Christine. What a great producer Christine is. I'm going to give Christine. Oh, I can't give any reactions. Oh, well, here we go. OK, now. Many moons ago, I shared with you this list, Mary's Rules of Wine and Food. And, you know, people always say, oh, Mary, they're not rules, they're guidelines. Well, you know what? Just like a rule is, uh, Asaf, excuse me, I'm sorry, I don't want to make gender biased comments, but it's possible a man won't understand this. Just the way that I, it's a rule that I would never wear horizontal stripes on my hips. These are rules. Uh, I've practiced these rules. They never, ever, ever let me down. So um, I've sent a copy of this. To, I think I've. I think we've gone over this before. I've sent a copy to Christine. If you'd like to request a copy of this. And we're going to base our talk on these rules of wine and food. And I recommend that you develop your own rules of wine and food. Okay, now, interestingly enough, today we're going to start with rule seven. In case of emergency, serve light red. The reason you want to, if you have, a, if you have no time and a lot of food, and you can only serve one wine, you want to serve a light red. It'll go with meat. It'll go with chicken. It'll go with veggie items. It might not go with things like shrimp cocktail. It won't go with dessert. But a light red will be good with just about anything. And we have a light red, literally, coming right at us for the holidays. And it is Le Beaujolais Nouveau. Now you might guess that Nouveau means new. And you would be correct. Uh, Beaujolais Nouveau, or Nouveau Beaujolais, is the first wine allowed by law in France to be released. And traditionally, it was the you can imagine how important wine is to France's economy. And of course, it was greeted with harvest festivals. It was kind of a local thing. <laughs> French chefs got a hold of it. And it got to be the thing that wherever you were a chef, you'd get in your sports car and race 
to Beaujolais. Uh, it's allowed to be released on November uh, 19th. So you'd get in your sports car in Paris or in Bordeaux and you'd race to Beaujolais so that you could get there at, you know, 1201, November 19th, grab your Beaujolais Nouveau and get back to your restaurant so that you would be the first person in town to serve Nouveau. Well, then a very shrewd Beaujolais producer said, well, we don't want to hog all the fun. Let's open this up. So he kind of dropped the hint in America and around the world. And when I was a young sommelier, it got to be chic once again to race to O'Hare, grab your nouveau from, from the, you know, the lockup there because it couldn't be released. Remember, it couldn't be released until November 19th and race back to your restaurant and serve it. I remember as a so Millier at the 95th, we'd be covered by the Tribune and it was, it would be all sorts of fun. Well, the excitement has kind of died down now. And also the wine now is, uh, because this has injected so much money into Beaujolais. I mean, this is a cash cow. This is a profit engine. You make it, you bottle it, you sell it. And now it can be released somewhat in bond. So for instance, Whole Foods might have theirs now, but it has to be locked up. Binnie's might have theirs now, but it has to be locked up. It can't go for sale until November 19th. Now there used to be all sorts of reviews about it, uh, I haven't found any reviews. Maybe there are other more important things going on in the world. Who knows? Uh, it's just a light, friendly red wine. Uh, the grape is Gamay. Uh, you think of Gamay as the jammy gammy because it has nice jammy flavors. It's not sweet, but it's very, very fruity. There's no complexity to it. It's just an easy, easy red. Um, and it's just a fun thing to have at your Thanksgiving table. The trick is you need to drink it up before January 1st because, you know, it, it, it's not made to last. Uh, and the saying is after January 1st, your nouveau turns into old vol. So buy a bottle or two, enjoy it, and get rid of it by January 1st. Okie dokie. Now also we said, in case of emergency, serve dry red, uh, light red or dry rosé. Now last week we talked about this guy, Randall Graham, the Roan Ranger. And this is one of his wines called Vin Gris de Cigare. Vin Gris means gray wine. Uh, in wine terms, there's white wine and there's kind of black wine, noir. And this is gray wine, which kind of means pink or rosé. Here's the story behind this label. The main wine is called Le Cigare Volant, the flying cigar. And in France, a flying saucer, what we call a flying saucer, or a UFO, is called a flying cigar. And it seems that in the vineyards of the Rhone, there's a law saying that no flying cigar can land in the vineyards of the Rhone. It's against the law for a vineyard to land in the, for a flying cigar to land in the vineyards of the Rhone. And here is a picture of Le Cigar Volant, the flying cigar, and gee, it wants to land in the, in the vineyards of the Rhone, but it's prevented by law. Uh, so this is gonna be a lovely, rich, it, it has a French name, 
but it is an American wine, and this is going to be a lovely, rich, dry rosé. Once again, good from your appetizers all the way up until Turkey. Okay, next, we're going to rule number nine, sweeter for the sweets. It's very difficult to really believe me until you try this experiment. But this experiment works all the time. You uh, take a mouthful of uh, food. Let's say, I don't know. Well, let's say, let's say turkey with cranberries, let's say. And you have it with a dry wine. You have it with a little bit of a sweet wine. And oh boy, isn't that good. Then you have it with a dry wine. And the if the wine is drier than the food, all you taste from the wine is acid and bitterness. I do this with my classes all the time and people are really astounded. Now think of all the sweet food we have for Thanksgiving. We have sweet potatoes. We have acorn squash, maybe with a little molasses in them. We have yams. We have sweet cranberry dressing. If we're doing ham, we have honey baked ham. You cannot serve a dry wine with foods that are, have a little sweetness. So I say, go to a beautiful Riesling and one producer that you can rely on is Chateau Saint-Michel from the Columbia Valley. These wines here, this is their dry Riesling, and then this is their standard Riesling. These are available at, you know, every grocery store in the known universe for like $12.99. If you want to step up, this is Eroica, Eroica which as you know, uh, as you may know, is an homage to a, a, a symphony by Beethoven. And this wine was made in collaboration with Dr. Ernst Lussen, uh, considered to be one of the greatest winemakers in the world, uh, located in the Mosul Valley. The, wine, the grapes are from the Columbia Valley, but Dr. Lussen consults. So this is going to be maybe $24.99. Then we get up to some really, really, and let me say, uh, the dry Riesling is about as sweet as a underripe pear. The Riesling might be as sweet as a really ripe pear. Aroica is going to be sweet as a nectarine, but it has such firm acidity, it doesn't taste sweet. And then this is a gorgeous bottle of wine. This is a, a single vineyard, the Cold Creek Vineyard. This is going to be rich and round and exotic and sweet and firmly acidic. Really a gorgeous wine. Uh, I think this is going to be more than $25. Uh, but it really is a gorgeous bottle of wine. Okay, now let's not forget cider. Cider, after all, is wine. Cider is wine. Uh, by, by American law, by the TTB, it's described as a wine uh, made from fruit uh, under 6% alcohol. So, so we have ciders made out of pears, we have ciders made out of apples, and you know, here we are in apple country. So there's a lot of wonderful cider available. Uh, of course, one of the guys we have to thank for all our apples is John Chapman, Johnny Appleseed, uh, who lived from 1774, let me see, to 1845, and single-handedly, Johnny Appleseed planted thousands and thousands of acres with a wide variety of apples. Uh, now, these were not for eating. These were called spitting apples. 
In other words, these were apples that were so tart that you couldn't really eat them, but they were perfect to ferment. Now, John, uh, who was a very, he, he was a devout follower of the Swedenborn religion. He was not a drinker, uh, but cider, of course, like wine in the, in the frontier, was safer than water uh, because fermentation fights off bacterial infection. And John Chapman uh, is really responsible for America's wealth of apples. Uh, he looked just like this. He, he slept outside on the ground. He was a devout uh, vegetarian, uh, very much animal rights, human rights. Uh, the good news is he, he died a very wealthy man, although he didn't, he didn't spend any of his wealth. He died a very wealthy and admired man. So that's Johnny Appleseed. Okay. You know, we all think of drinking sparkling wine, of course, on New Year's Eve. In America, Thanksgiving is the second top day that we consume champagne and sparkling wine. And sparkling wine is a perfect compliment. We're going to, yes, you, we're going to skip over. This is, this is the rule that I call look for opposites that attract. And I'm going to go right to this greasy. Think of all the delicious fatty foods we have. Yum, dips, cocktail franks, meatballs, lox, uh, this is rumaki. Does anybody ever make rumaki anymore? Yeah, they do. Well, rumaki is bacon wrapped around a chicken liver and a, a water chestnut. And it, boy, is it good. And here's some little fried, maybe a little spanakopita or something. And the, and the, the rule, look for opposites that attract with this wonderful, unctuous, greasy stuff Sparkling wine gives you scrubbing bubbles. The, the sparkle literally lifts, lifts all this delicious grease off the palate. So your, your palate is not weighted down. Now I should say the acidity from Riesling will do the same thing. Uh, this is a what, what I'm suggesting is a Blanc de Noir. A white, a white wine from black grapes. So this is a wine based on Pinot Noir. So it's going to be a little bit richer. This is a gorgeous bottle of wine, and I'm really surprised. Uh, this is in the, I think this is under $25. Uh, this is a really a wonderful value uh, if, if you want something elegant uh for your holiday table now there's plenty of other sparkling wines out there you don't have to spend 25 dollars. you can get a little prosecco you can get a little chateau saint michel makes a pretty decent sparkler and the benefit with a sparkling wine is uh first of all if you have a, a child you can get some soda water put it in a sparkling wine glass, maybe add a little maraschino cherry juice, and then you have a sparkling kitty cocktail. Or if somebody, an adult, wants a uh, sparkling wine, but they want it a little sweet, you can make a classic cocktail, uh, a kir, which is sparkling wine and creme de cassis, which is black currant liqueur. And if you don't have any black currant liqueur sitting around, again, pour a little maraschino cherry juice and you can sweeten it up and it will be delicious. I will also mention there's a wonderful sparkling cider on the market uh, called Martinelli's. 
it's, as I say, it's at every, maybe not grocery stores, but uh, certainly at uh, every Binnie's. It's definitely at Whole Foods. It's at many, many grocery stores. Okay, remember the biochemistry of Bacchus. We know that red wine gets red because of red grape skins. And just like a skin of a banana, you bite into the skin of a banana, it's really bitter. Well, if you bit into a grape seed, it's pretty bitter too. That's tannin. Tannin biochemically bonds with fat and protein. It literally, the molecules bond. So many people, I think, are having turkey. A uh, certain amount of fat and protein, but not like a ribeye, not like a lamb stew. A certain amount of protein and fat. Also ham, a certain amount of fat and protein, but not as much as a steak, for instance. And so you, you don't want a high tannin wine. You don't, and uh, you know, you don't want a Syrah. You don't want a Cabernet Sauvignon. You don't want Merlot. You don't want Malbec. You want a wine with softer tannin such as a Beaujolais or Pinot Noir. So when you're shopping for uh, your ham or your turkey, think Pinot Noir. Uh, I gave you uh, a recommendation for the Ponzi, as did Christine. I think last week uh, we talked about uh, Pinot Noir too. You know, before I leave the Beaujolais, uh, behind. I looked all over for American Gamay. Sadly, it just doesn't exist anymore. But many of you have mentioned this wine, uh, Two Buck Chuck, which is now Three Buck Chuck, which is named after Charles Shaw. Well, Charles Shaw was a wonderful winemaker, and Gamay was his specialty. He made Charles Shaw, it was called Valdigui, which is an old French term for the grape, Valdigui. He made the most beautiful Beaujolais-like wine in Napa Valley. It was, it was stunning. It was absolutely beautiful. Then he got involved in a bad divorce and had to sell his property. Well, I knew Charles, Mr. Shaw, way back when. So I did a little search. Well, first of all, I found out that he's partial owner of a winery in Michigan called, shoot, uh, didn't write it down, but if you Google Charles Shaw, Miss Michigan Winery, it will come up. But even more interesting, he, he moved to Winnetka. You know, he lost everything. He lost his name. Can you imagine? He lost his name. But he moved to Winnetka. He's in the financial data something. And uh, I sent him a link, an e a LinkedIn email. I hope he gets back to me because he was a wonder. He's a wonderful, kind, and gentle person. Okay, moving on. Okay, boy, we're moving fast today. Yeah. Okay, so here we are at the end. Sweeter for the sweet. So now we're talking about really sweet wines. Uh, foods. If you want to serve wine with dessert, it has to be significantly sweeter than all these delicious Thanksgiving sweet treats. Here's another thing from Chateau Saint-Michel. Harvest Select. I bet this is a 375 bottle. I bet this is a half bottle. And this will be about as sweet as honey. 
Now, when you serve it to people, you know, if it's not with your dessert, they're going to taste it and they're going to say, oh, it's so sweet. You know, well, then they're going to dive into their strawberry shortcake and their pumpkin pie. And uh, so it's important to serve it with the dessert. Also, it's important to serve it in a very small glass. I've showed you this Riesling glass before. And even so, you're only going to pour at most two ounces. This is not the kind of wine you knock back. This is the kind of wine, this might be called a vino, vin, vino de meditazione. This is a wine that you just put a drop on your palate and you savor the sweetness. Uh, this is going to be sweet as nectar from the gods is what it's going to be. It's going to taste like, you know, beautiful, beautiful honey. Uh, what you do is you go to your merchant and you say, I'd love, I'd like a late harvest wine. Uh, California does make beautiful late harvest wines. You could go to Canada and get an ice wine. If you wanted to, you could get a Moscato de Asti. Uh, but definitely for your holiday sweet treats, you definitely need uh, to remember sweeter for the sweets. And I hope I'm going to see you all before the holidays, but I certainly want to wish each and every one of you and your family good wine and good health through the holidays and into the new year. Thank then, you. Thank we really you. moved in a clip today. Does anyone have any um, questions on what Mary's gone over or have any wines maybe that you are looking at already serving for your holiday and wanted to ask about or anything at all? Mary, what would your recommendation be if you're serving a variety of meats? So let's say you're doing a turkey, you're doing a ham, maybe you're... you're say well, you're Deborah, uh, you know, uh, I would love you to drink American uh, if you don't mind going to our sister in Liberty in France. You, you know, for instance, maybe you start with a Beaujolais Nouveau just for fun. You know, one bottle, knock it off, serve it a little chilled and get rid of it. Then you might want to go to a Cru Beaujolais, C-R-U, a Cru Beaujolais. This is the top of the Beaujolais categories. They're wonderful values. They're very soft. They have a lot of, it used to be called the poor man's uh, Burgundy. Uh, but they kind of got a little bit more expensive. They're beautiful in the mouth, very relaxing in the mouth. You can serve them a little bit chilled uh, or not room temperature. Uh, you know, do you have a retailer, uh, a wine merchant, Deb, that you work with? I usually, I know somebody at Benny's that's given me some really great recommendations. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's that person, that per what that person loves is to figure out what Deborah Bosco likes to drink. That that's that person's goal. I can I can tell you that. Absolutely. And if you say to that person, oh, I'm thinking about a crew Beaujolais. Uh, maybe you get a couple of crews or maybe you get uh, uh, the same crew from different producers. Or maybe you just make it really easy on yourself and just get a Cru Beaujolais for everybody. If you must, if you, you know, if you feel like you want to drink American, I would say a Pinot Noir. Maybe you don't want to go to the Ponzi Reserve. Maybe you want to look at the Ponzi Classico, which is a very pretty drink or maybe look at the Ponzi Tavola. 
Uh, so again, something very soft and tannin, easy on the palate, because I know you're going to, you're going to want to keep drinking. Uh, so, and you know, I don't know, maybe you want to have a rosé on hand, I don't know, but I think a Beaujolais or a Pinot Noir uh, will satisfy. Now, I don't know what you're serving as an appetizer, so that well, you know what? For your appetizer, serve the Nouveau and then move into your Beaujolais or move into your Pinot Noir. Okay, thanks. My pleasure. Anyone else? No? Well... I hope that everyone, it seems like everyone's like seriously satisfied. I'm sure notes were taken and everyone is already planning out menus and getting ready to put shopping lists together and whatnot. So Mary, thank you so you much. You know, I have a comment. If, if anybody gets into a, like a wine thing, you know, oh my God, what do I do? You know, email me. I check my uh, Kendall email very early in the morning. Uh, email me. I'm happy, happy, happy to say, no, don't buy that. Yes, do buy this. Perfect. Yeah. And if you're not a member of the Kendall and NLU community, always, you can email me at taste at nl.edu and I can reach out to Mary to get any um, questions answered. And not just Mary, John and, um, and Sruthi and any other of our uh, staff and faculty here at Kendall. I am happy to be the one to help answer questions for any of you. So, um, Mary, anything else? I can't think of anything. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. This was, the, you know, this was kind of a, one of our shorter lectures, but it's great because it was all straight and to the point. It's all like, this is, this is what you need and it's gonna be an amazing Thanksgiving, even if it might be different than you usually see your Thanksgiving. So um, definitely everyone, uh, good health, good wealth and everything else to you all. Have a fantastic evening, all right? Bye everyone. Thanks everybody, bye.